Good afternoon, everyone. Graveyard session where everybody had a nice lunch. Very nice lunch. Thank you. But then everybody's a little bit dreary eyed. Okay, so we the opposite paper of our previous. So you were from a computer science technical background. Marita Turpin, which is my co author, and myself, we are in information systems, which means we look at technical solutions proposed by the professionals and then we look at why don't they work in the real world? Because people or organizations or societies don't want to adopt the technologies. And we're trying to find out why or why not, or what we can do to get these technologies adopted. So that's really the, the problem. So don't ask me, I'm not an expert in distributed ledger technology. Maybe Marita knows a little bit more about that. But so we're looking more at ad adoption issues and practical issues and societal problems. So if I present, will that um still go through sure just check if you don't get it um... uh, I get it. could you try to turn this way oh i get it okay yeah okay yeah, it's, it's... Uh, I'll stay seated because otherwise it's too difficult to 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 to, to advance what I'm saying. So we from South Africa. So the research was actually done by Johnny Prince, and he did that for the honors research. So we're not the experts, but Johnny couldn't come. So now we we are here to come and visit uh, this beautiful place, Sofia. So we we're looking forward to sharing some of our findings with you. Why right, this isn't working? Just like that. Yeah, I okay, so we're going to go through the normal things, just to sort of introduce the research to you, the research methodology, and then spend most of the time probably in question time, not in discussion time. Uh, I'm not going to work by that clock because that clock doesn't seem to be moving very fast. So I think most of you know more about distributed ledger technology and blockchain technology than I do. So I will, in those questions, I will ask you to answer the questions. But so, um, the nice thing about DLT, distributed ledger technology, is that you decentralize the uh, the database and that you, you can't change the records. And that's two important reasons why you would want to. So you, you, the access is, is dis distributed and the storage is distributed and then nobody can change afterwards. And it's often when you try and hide corrupt activities, obviously people are trying to remove the trace of what's happened. Okay, And that's why it's very attractive as a potential technical tool to stop um, corruption. Now, in South Africa, we have a number of anti-corruption agencies, um, and I think the Hawks are the best known ones to us, or uh, to the people maybe outside as well. And as you all know, ICT is both used to facilitate corruption and also to prevent corruption. It's like you know, uh, hacking, you know, you use ICT tools to hack, and then you use ICT tools to prevent hacking, and it's always a war of who is ahead of whom all the time. So in our research, or in Johnny's research, basically he's looking at how effective are ICTs, information communication technologies in general, and then specifically uh, digital ledger technologies, how, how useful are those? And you've got to realize that the anti-corruption agencies are very, very small, in South Africa. So definitions, you can read them in the paper. Corruption is where uh, entrusted power, typically in government officials, but also sometimes in, in private corporations, is abused for the private gain, typically of that person that actually is, is being corrupt. And then corruption uh, in procurement typically happens. So you, you can follow the whole corruption, uh, the procurement process. It starts from tendering to then awarding a tender, then to executing the, the procurement and the payment. And so each of those cycles, you can actually have corruption happening. And if I jump ahead to the conclusion is basically that digital ledger technology just focus on one of these stages. And at the moment, the corruption to be prevented is actually not mainly happening at one stage or what happens is in the corruption moves to the other phases. And so it's more the systems in the entire process that you actually need to govern better and just a technical solution in one of the stages will not prevent it. So I'm jumping ahead for the conclusion there. You've all heard about blockchain. Some of you got rich, some of you got poor. The rich people are not here. The poor people are staying here still with us. So, but uh, I'm not going to talk much about blockchain, but blockchain is the underlying technology where you have, you know, uh, the, the um, each block embedding uh, the next hash 
of the previous records, and so you can't alter the previous records because that would change the hash, and basically that would proliferate. So you can't change earlier blocks because the hash of the earlier blocks is each embedded in the following blocks. Okay, and, and that. So South Africa is a very interesting case that yesterday we did a tour, we weren't attending here, so we did a tour of the city and we heard about the history of Bulgaria. And South Africa's history is actually quite, uh, who's from Bulgaria here? No one, just you, are you from Bulgaria? Also, oh. okay, so Bulgaria had also a social upheaval when, you know, the communists uh, fell in 1993, 94. And so in South Africa, we had also the shift to democracy where black people finally got the, the majority of the people got the democratic vote. And so in Bulgaria, what happened is Bulgaria went to 10 years of upheaval and depression, economic depression, and so on. In South Africa, it was almost the opposite. South Africa, after democracy, you know, we were with Nelson Mandela and we were the darling of the international investment community. So a lot of money, a lot of goodwill was coming into the country. So in South Africa, we had this high expectations for about a decade, uh, maybe 15 years. And then what happened is then the second, after Nelson Mandela with Abu Mbeki, which was still okay, but not so technically good. And we ran a little bit out of goodwill. And then we had a, a Jacob Zuma, and he was really starting of the entrenchment of a lot of corruption in South Africa. And so we went, a lot of African countries are known for a lot of corruption. I think a lot of Eastern European countries also had to struggle internally with corruption problems. So, but in South Africa, corruption really became very bad from about 2008, became entrenched, a whole of the government's service was broken down. And so even though we significant to do this, this is a real big problem. And I think our current president is trying to fight that, but Zuma had 10 years of being able to entrench and corruption comes from the top. If it's tolerated by the top, then everybody else below that can then see, well, if they can do it, we can do it as well. And they don't get bullet. So. so, so on corruption in this year, South Africa is very bad in terms of e-government. So the use of ICTs for within the government and to government to government, government to citizen, we are actually fairly high. I think maybe a little bit too high according to speech jobs. I think the blues don't come out very well on this graphic, but the bump on places. So we, we're on the high level, but I think it's very different from government agency to government agency. Like the tax revenue collection is very strong in electronic ECT, ICT use, okay? But the corruption and the procurement is not so strong. And so that's where a lot of corruption comes in, and that's why we look at it. So IT or ICTs can be used in lots of spaces for fighting corruption, like just even making your public services digital allows already for uh, supervisors to monitor better. You can do crowdsourcing where you actually allow citizens to report uh, corruption activities. You can have whistleblowing platforms where people can report anonymously uh, specific individuals and upload evidence. Um, if you have transparency portals where you basically you can see what's happening. And then finally also DLT and blockchain technology is yet another one of these potential promising tools, but maybe not in practice. So I don't need to teach you all about the DLT, uh, what it is. So it's distributed, meaning there's not one single database, but the multiple databases. You have timestamps. Um, all the nodes of the distributed database agree on one version of the truth. Once you've created a block, it's immutable, it's secure, and obviously, and uh, obviously, in a procurement session, you want to have programmable uh, blockchain so you can have smart contracts in there that automatically execute various options of the tendering process, or releasing of funds, and so on uh, as it happens. And so there's a difference between blockchain technology and distributed ledger technology. So like in blockchain, you know, cryptocurrencies often you work with the concept of tokens, like NFTs, for instance. Okay, so in digital ledgers, you don't need tokens. Um, so blockchain technologies, cryptocurrencies are widely adopted, but digital ledger technologies is still relatively new in terms of real world practical implications. Blockchain technologies, cryptocurrency is very power hungry, you know, this, this mining of, of, of the tokens, whereas uh, digital ledger technologies are actually not power hungry at all because you don't need to have proof of, um, no, of calculations and so on. Um, so I'm not going to go into the details there, but if you look at how DLT is used in Africa, 
we have not many examples, good examples of using DLT in Africa. We have Nigeria Customs Service in Ghana, very interesting. So in Africa, we have a lot of problems with the registration of deeds and land titles. Okay, because a lot of it's happened in, in, informally and so on. So uh, DLT is really a good solution for that. And I think in, Afri in South Africa, if I would find one use case for adopting, it would be actually for land ownership records uh, rather than for, uh, I'll come to that later on. So Kenya, micro lending, Ethiopian tracks, uses blockchain technology to, to, to track um, origin of um, coffee. Uh, and then South Africa was looking more for transactions between banks and, and transferring. That project started and it was not very successful, so I think they're shelved for the moment being. So blockchain technology has been in a lot of, by a lot of academics, they said like, this is amazing for e-government and so on. And in Canada and in Scandinavia, um, they've already implemented some of that. Uh, but in Africa, and, and in fact, in the global south, there's very little of that happening. So each of these benefits are potential benefits, okay? They're not really actually actualized benefits in the lower implementation. And that's the problem again of having too many academics in a room and they, they, they always say like, what, what, what technology promises and then you get the consultants hopping on board because they see juicy contracts for the governance, okay, to, to prototype these things. And then the consultants can walk away and then the government sit with these prototypes that they can't do anything with. So I think it's an, important for academics to also be self-reflective and that's what we're doing here is actually saying hang on wait a minute yes the promise is a lot but can be implemented in practice and unintended consequences what will happen if you then implement blockchain technology in that stage so we use the conceptual framework it's not really a model or a theory it's called the technology organization environment framework where we look at if, you, if an organization wants to adopt the technology, there's a multiple sets of factors. Some factors are unique to the technology, for instance, like the support, the maturity of the technology, and so on. Then there's a clunch of factors or a bunch of factors that are unique to the organization, like the organizational culture, the expertise, the way the, the, the centralized nature of the organization, the maturity of the organization, and so on. And then there's specific technology factors. Um, uh, so that's what we use. The methodology that we approach is like we don't run models, we don't develop, develop theories, we actually either ask people's opinions or we solicit by survey or with the experience with, with the experts, so that's social science technologies. In this case, it's a very small unit that looks at um, um, corruption, okay, so in South Africa, and they're very overstretched. So the unit is very, so we interviewed the people that actually work there and are trying to prosecute the cases of corruption. And we're saying like, would the introduction of blockchain technology and ICT in general, how well would that help you in your job? Okay, and so we used qualitative analysis. There's not something you can send a survey out. There's very few people, so we want to go in depth. And then we use what is called qualitative analysis. Okay, we do thematic analysis on the answers. We use a product called Invivo. For those of you who know that, so that's what it looks like. You start with some coding the interview transcripts, and then you group these in themes, and then you map these themes across. You refine the themes. You often make hierarchies of these themes, and so on. So there's a, there's a bit of a of a research methodology. It's not as rigorous as the type of uh, methodologies that you use in computer science, but it is actually very informative in terms of learning what works or what doesn't work. So the people that we interviewed, we had nine interviews, but one we couldn't use for, um, because then at the end of the interview, the person said, look, no, I, I'd rather not use our data. So ethics reasons, we couldn't use it. So we've got eight actual ones. You can see they have a lot of experience. They've been in that service, between, most of them more than 15 years, of trying to find corruption in government. So the people know what they're talking about. Most of them belong to professional. And so interesting, if you look in the middle column, losing the sea battle, the corruption battle. So we're asking people, do you think, are we winning the war? Or are we losing the war against corruption in, in, in government? And most of them, you know, five out of eight say no, we're not winning. So we're losing this battle against so corruption. Basically, there are being, uh, there's too many people doing too many corrupt uh, activities that we actually, as a small unit, we're not winning. Win. 
No, no, this is right now as we're speaking. So that was like done uh, last year, the interviews. And so they're basically saying like, at this moment in time, despite the current president trying to fight corruption, we losing the battle, we're not winning the battle. And I'll come back in the conclusion, make this good question. So the main reason for that is that even though they find the cases of corruption, what is happening is that even they they find the people who do corruption, they've got the evidence, they're not being prosecuted. And if, or if they're being prosecuted, the process drags on for five years, ten years, and in the end they get a slap on the hand and they walk away free. So there's no deterrence. If people were to be locked up, if these people that were per prosecuting, they could lock people up, if there was a visible enforcement and prosecution that resulted in lifetime sentences or prison sentences and paying back, then it would be much more efficient. So they can prosecute, they can find the cases, the public and out, there's the evidence, but it, the problem is that the political will to put people in prison is not there. And the reason for that is that people involved are typically in high power positions and they sort of, there's divided loyalties at the top of the political chain and I'm not releasing that. So thank you for that question. Um, and so the other interesting question is South Africa is, is the still an economic powerhouse on the continent, and definitely in terms of population. Nigeria is the biggest economy, but Nigeria's got like five times as big a population as South Africa. So we've got a population of about 60 million. Nigeria's got over 200 million, so like four times their population. But so our economic, it depends a bit on exchange rate, which exchange rate you use. So South Africa is definitely still the largest, most powerful economy in terms of per, per capita population, so, so, but in terms of technology, so technology, the use of ICTs in the private sector is really very advanced, but in the government sector, it is not so advanced. And so that's why the people interviewed, I think they come from a unit in government where ICTs are not used very well. And so they perceive that South Africa is lagging in terms of technologies. So as mentioned, most of the people think that we're not winning the battle. So this, there's a couple of agencies, but then not powerful enough and the execution of when they discover corruption, people are being sent to. to. So we have made some progress that so things are getting better, not worse as they used to be. Like five years ago, most of us in South Africa were very negative. Now we're seeing some hope, but you know, it's very easy to derail the little process to have. So the supporting the bottom thing is that on the, the corruption index, South Africa, is low and sadly there's a good reason for that um, so that's the thing so in terms of not using and i'm talking about uh distributed ledger technology not using icts in general uh, are they being effective in fighting corruption so there's some mechanisms so like national treasury has got a list of preferred bidders so if you're not on that list you need to be vetted as if you want to be tendering for the government contract, or you want to support the government, they need to go to special processes. So there's a centralized database, and the database was centralized specifically because in a lot of provincial governments, uh, there was too much corruption happening. So they centralized it nationally. So hoping that that means now that there's less agency for provincial. Local authorities can still do it, but provincial authorities can no longer uh, rule. So the, the record is now centralized. But now that means also that if you have a corrupt official in a centralized spot, it's easier for them to do corruption. And so again, it's this two-edged sword that ICTs can stop corruption now at the provincial level. But on the other hand, if you've got the in at the national level, then it's easier, then it facilitates corruption. Okay, and we'll see that with DLTs uh, that are happening as well. So some of the comments is it's not about the technology because the corruption does often not happen at the technology level. You know, once the tender is awarded or once the contract is executed and the payment, I mean, then everything looks perfectly okay from me. And that's why a lot of corruption in the first world, in Europe, you know, in Germany, there's also corruption, but it looks genuinely, it looks above board because everything is following the process. Where does the corruption happen? In the pub or the restaurant where people go face to face and they say like, you know, if you do this, then we do that. That's where the corruption is. And that you can't capture uh, or fight with the ICTs. Okay, and so that's the one of the things. So, um, so they find that the use of ICTs works both ways, but it's not always effective because the corruption is not necessarily happening in the recorded activities. 
Then in terms of the unit in which we are working now, can they use technology to enhance their activities? That was the next question you asked them. And there, the story is very sad because these people are very experienced, but they don't know how to use technologies. And the few that actually want to use technologies, they're not given the power or the resources to actually use the technology. I mean, one of the uh, um, investigators just asked for a piece of analysis software to help him with his activities, and like he's not given it. It's not there's money, there's budget, there's all of those things, but it's just like the process, the red tape, he can't get the software that he is requesting to help him mine these databases, basically the data analytics that he's trying to use. So there's no will or there's no resources for them to do. But apart from these few people that actually want and you want to use the technologies, there's too many people in there. People, you know, as old as me, but not interested in technology and they don't want to learn. Oh, okay, five minutes. But the clock is still looking. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Okay, so the investigators are scared of using data. And again, so it's not the technology that's the problem. It is the human issues, the, the organizational culture. And so when we ask the questions about DLTs, if they don't understand ICTs in general, then they don't even understand DLTs. Okay, even though there's investigators, they don't really have to understand the technology because the technology should be embedded in the systems. So that is, so the other thing they point out is that they need the regulations to, to guard these TLT technologies because it's in prosecuting uh, fraud and corruption, you actually need to have the legal backup. And if you can't use it in court as an evidence, then it's also useless, okay? And especially if, because the judges don't know these technologies either in South Africa. So if, the, if it is not embedded in the legal framework or the policy framework, um, then you can't use the technologies either. And so that's the other problem. So I'm not going to go too much. So there's lots of examples of how we used ICT well in the government and sector, but not sadly in the procurement and not sadly in the prosecution uh, of, of, of public. So I'm going to skip this slide because we're running out of it. So the other thing is that there's various versions of DLTs, and so you've got to look at which versions and which options you're setting. For instance, like you would use permission blockchains rather than uh, so we have pre-approved nodes rather than open nodes and so on. Okay, the legality of these regulations is very important. And the most important thing is that just implementing blockchain technology on that part of the procurement cycle will not help, especially not if you have so many officials that are not aware of technology. So to me, what you actually need is first to transform the thinking of the, that service, not just the one service, that's prosecuting, but also the whole procurement cycle. And then you have to show, because a lot of the systems in place already are fairly good at, you know, you have these uh, logging of activities and tracking of user activities and, and logins. So that is not where the problem lies. The problem lies in the governance of what is happening, the processes. And so to me, if we as academics or consultants are trying to sell blockchain technology to the South African government, we're doing a, a bad deal here. That's not where we, they, you're trying to make them run or you're trying to sell them a pipe dream that technology will fix a problem that is actually not a technological problem. So that's the, so I'm not against blockchain technology. Like I said, I believe it like for land registration would be beautiful. For universities, for like degrees of students, it would be beautiful technology. But in terms of fighting corruption in the procurement cycle, so I don't think that's where we want to go. And so that's that's basically the conclusions that I said. So lack of training is a big, big issue, and so it's not technological. So we can't generalize or define because obviously well, it's a very small unit. And so this of the 14 people we interviewed, eight people, so we know what is happening there. So it's representative of the corruption, anti-corruption unit in South Africa. But whether the same applies, I would think the same issues apply in the rest of Africa. I'm not speaking for Europe, Northern America, but in Africa, I think what we found here would be the same thing. So I don't see a future for blockchain technology and digital ledger technology fighting corruption in units where we have the same organizational or, or governance issues. Okay, so first it says the maturity of the units there. Maybe in the next phase. So, and that's where we say, well, if you want to try out some prototypes, 
do it prototype because then you will see that the barriers are not technological barriers. Okay, and so any questions you have, you can ask Professor Turpin, not me. Okay. <laughs> You know, in, in several instances, we start from just what we want to ensure that the copies of the media is the same. So we actually want to, want to, want to make the contracts or what they start there assigned to people in So that's the idea. Okay, so that's a very good question because. DLT is a bit like AI and so on. It should be a technology that you don't have at the surface. It's not a standalone technology. So it should be embedded in the systems and should be invisible to the user. So to me, DLT should be embedded in your accounting system or your transaction system. And so like if you're using SAP system, then SAP should just have a switch saying like enable blockchain technology. And um, most of my research is actually on open government data. So you should then you know, open up the database to maybe the whole public or to a vested interest and saying you have an insight in the procurement database so you can analyze. So rather than having public officials who probably have got their backside, open up the database, the transaction database of the tenders and the procurement, open that up to the public. And then you will have citizen groups looking at these databases and they will be able to say, hang on, there's something funny happening here. So, because tender, I mean, it's public money. So, I think tender processes are supposed to be open. Uh, procurements are supposed to be open unless there's a specific reason, like for military spending or whatever it is. No, no, not, not at the moment. So, it should be. So, that the, the two things I said DLT should be embedded in the commercial, and hopefully in the long term, it will be embedded in commercial transactional database systems. Because what is happening now is we have these homebrew transaction systems. And so what's happened, like even in commercial banks, we had a case just last week where they discovered that officials, bank officials, were bypassing the official accounting system and operating directly, deleting the transactions in the database outside the system. And then there was no longer a record of what had happened. So it was not logged, it was not in the accounting system, but the database showed that the money had been transferred. And there was no trace record of it. So you need to have people with very sharp knowledge of knowing how the systems were coded. So obviously it is an insider job. Whereas if you have a plug public system whereby DLT is embedded in the system, then you can't do that. Does that answer your question a bit? The, the reason I'm asking is because uh, at some point in your presentation to explain that the problem is exactly in the way of the spreads. The solution is also not in the That's an excellent question. And so, and the answer, I've got a very good answer for you because it depends. And that's, that's an answer for every question here. Yeah? It depends. But for whistleblowing, it depends exactly on, so the public, in general, the public people are prepared to whistleblow and report things if they see there's an action coming from it. And so we had, for instance, like a crime hotline where people would see crime happening in the community and they will, if you open up this crime hotline, people will phone and say something happening. And then people, the public watches what happens. We then they see the police acting on these hotlines, on these steps, and they see people being prosecuted or imprisoned or whatever it is, then more and more of those activities happen. But what typically happens is that you open a hotline, people report some crimes, but nothing happens. And then people stop reporting. You know? So in this case, what we're seeing is we had a couple of cases where people did whistle blow on activity happening. And then in some cases, what's happened is that actually the figure out who these people get killed and shot, the whistleblowers. Okay. In other cases, things have happened. So it depends on the department and type of activity and even which part of the country you are. So in certain provinces, government law enforcement is better. Like I would say in the Western Cape, if whistleblowing activity happens, it will typically be followed up. 
in the Eastern Cape, which is just neighboring. If you did a whistleblower, you might find that your body is there, you know, in your life expectancy drops by a lot of time, even if it's supposedly anonymous. So that's the short answer. There's a long answer, obviously, as well, that goes much more deeper. But so that's, it depends on the government's commitment to, to following up. And again, that's a human and political problem. Yes, and uh, one question for me about the feasibility of applying DLT in different national services that you mentioned. Have you done any simulation or studies uh, how resource consuming such solutions would be? So, let's say the amount of data that should be stored in DLT, uh, also having in mind the uh, efficiency uh, of possible. So okay, so we have not done a simulation, but the nice thing about ELT is it is not resource intensive. You know, crypto crypto mining is very resource intensive, but the distributed database with the blockchain technology where you just have the hashes encoded uh, is not very resource intensive. It's maybe times three or times four the amount of work, but it's fairly resource efficient. You know, if you don't want to create tokens and do proof of work and so on, then it is not resource intensive. So I don't think there's an issue with the resource consumption. So I don't think that's where the problem is. Not in, in, in these systems. Good question, but that's where the difference is with cryptocurrency and other blockchain technologies. For distributed ledger technologies in normal transaction with uh, authorized nodes, it's not an issue. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I can understand the part of the blockchain to ensure that the uh, trust is uh, and so on. Maybe maybe you need also to well, uh, another layer of the system in which a piece of big data can assign your uh, procurement uh, at the AI, the application problem, in which you can highlight what is the best solution on the basis of criteria when you are advertising uh, your uh, procurement. And uh, the, the AI or the system will decide that the best solution provided an answer. At some point, uh, the human that has to decide, the should decide which uh, is uh, the, the winner, mm -hmm. has to motivate when the answer is different with respect to the system that promotes the best solution in the case of the criteria. Mm -hmm. And it should be not difficult to implement because uh, the criteria are defined when they are found in procurement. I want to come back to the comment that he said. It's like, why don't you put the humans back in the loop mm -hmm. and let the humans make the decision? And to me, so a better solution than implementing DLT is actually just open up the data. Because if you open up the data, then you have a whole lot of organizations with best interest to actually look at the data and start mining for, hang on, how come systematically the tenders here are 5% or 10% more expensive? And we have lots of examples of how open, opening up the open government data applied to procurement has actually highlighted systematic biases and, 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 and corruption activities in areas. At the moment, the only city, and you can correct me, I think it's just the city of Cape Town, has opened up its supplier and tender da database. And so none of the national government has done that, none of the other provincial governments, none of the other local governments. To me, it's a human solution rather than, a, and so it pops back to you, but rather than having technical, it's open up the decision process to not just the auditors, but to the whole, why not? It's, it's, it's taxpayers' money. So it's a simple political discussion open up the database for everyone to see, you know, it doesn't have to be the database, just, just dump the reports every now and then. So, as a comment, yeah, because I agree that you know, opening the database for everyone to see is uh, on paper at least the best way, because uh, those are um, all those uh, non-government organizations or even individual people who look at it and say there's something wrong. But, being cynical here, uh, I can see that uh, when a government comes, which decides to open up everything and uh, provide uh, freely available open data on all transactions, etc., 
Well, naturally, there will be some problems because uh, you cannot control everyone. There will be some, there will be an issue here, an issue there, and all those small issues will pile up. And then another party will come and say, you see, this government is corrupt. We need to get rid of them. And once the good government loses the election, the other party comes in and says, well, now we are all saints, so we no longer need to put the data online because everything will be fine. And we are back to square one. So unfortunately, this is still goes back to the human problem. If uh, the citizens are not ready for the technology, if they uh, don't know what it entails, you can have the best systems and they will simply not work. So, that's a very good point. So I don't know which country you come from, uh, how many political parties, which country are you? Yeah, I'm from Poland. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I believe Bangladesh has got the same problem. So in South Africa, we don't have that many political parties, and I think Marita can probably talk about that. One. So the one local government that opened up the data is the, is the city of Cape Town. In the city of Cape Town, we have one party that has been dominating and it's very strong. So it's not, and it's not the national party. So not the ANC, which is running the country. It's the Democratic Alliance, which is a bit of the the white uh, party, whatever it is. But so it's an alliance of 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 interest, and they're very strong. And so they 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 big base for political is their transparency and the democracy and opening up. So they say we claim good governance. We want to show that we good governance, and so. And the Western Cape, they've also got a provincial government, so they're very strong. And I don't think the ANC is a real threat to them at the moment. So they have indeed the luxury of opening up. But I can see indeed, we've seen that all over Africa as well, where countries, more enlightened governments, are trying new initiatives in open government data and so on. And in the next election, they get held to account or, or you know, that's and then, and then people, and, and so we see that in America, you know, the Democrats versus the Republicans. Okay, I've got now, I've got my own party, but we see that sort of, you know, one party will make minor mistakes. You know, a, 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 a Clinton will have a, an email issue, whereas then you have a Republican that sort of like is corrupt as hell, and but it's just what you how you tell the story. But to me, that's another debate then. But yes, it is. There's no simple solution, sadly. In computer science, we have simple solutions or problems with, with, with optimi optimal solutions, but in social science and political science, we don't have. I also have a short question and it's a short answer. Okay, Marika. As you mentioned, this, uh, the study uh, has some limits. Of course, that's, that's the low rate, uh, low response rate. But the problem is very important as the discussion shows. We will have lens for the next step for the research. What next? Um, you know, this has been, been uh, the interviews have been done in, in one very specific form. Okay. Um, this, this is close. This is close or next steps will be? So let's look at what value has been added now. Yeah, I think the value of this study is that, you know, if someone's often comes to that one, we tell a giant of this particular government. Um, then I can look at the study and say, but no, you know, look at the bigger picture, look at the system, look at the people, um, you know, blockchain is not going to solve this problem. We need to look at the system more, uh, I think, more holistically. Um, so in that holistic picture, I think there's still a lot of work for us to do. Um, but, you know, for people to help see the, the role of technology in context. Thank you very much. Uh, Comments? <laughs> <laughs> so, so just to have an idea. It's not major. For procurement, government procurement, the number of transactions, it's, it's on the order of a large organization. So it's not, you know, it's a couple of hundreds, yeah, a couple of hundreds. Uh, if you take, so for national governments, it's a couple of hundreds maybe. A thousand or so. If you're looking there at all local governments, I mean, we have how many municipalities in South Africa? So, but it would be like ten thousand transactions, you know. So you have many seconds for one transaction. So, 
Whereas any da transactional database will do hundreds of transactions, if not thousands of transactions, easily per second. So it is not it is not a constraint. Still quite a Oh, so yes, there's a lot of so that's and in the manual processing, that's where a lot of corruption happens. So it's both the non-standardized systems on local government, and then the manual processes, which are like in the Eastern Cape, where a lot of processes are manual. So to me, the first step before you go to DLT, first try and have standardized processes, have a an internationally recognized transaction system like SAP or whatever it is, then implement the controls, you know, alongside with that, educate your all the departments, put in uh, human controls, system controls, organizational controls, auditing controls, all of those before we start going with NFTs and DLTs and all of those things. You know? Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Mr. Well. Thank you.